Lucy Letby is accused of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others. While she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, Letby denies all of the charges over the incidents. Lucy Letby was the only person working on the night shift. It was alleged in court that their mother was apparently told by Miss Letby, trust me, I'm a nurse. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations, the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven infants and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. In total, there are 22 charges, all of which she denies. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail, I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week on this podcast, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. The case against Lucy Letby is that she murdered or tried to kill 17 babies while she was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. She denies the charges. The babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons, and the identities of their families are also being protected. They're known only as babies A to Q. Seven of the babies died. Ten survived. Each one of these babies was or is someone's son or daughter and the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. We'll be bringing you that detail as the jury is hearing it from the prosecution and defence. We're getting behind the headlines to explain far more than the news reports you'll be reading, watching and listening to. And the importance of a fair trial is paramount, so we won't be getting into anything in this podcast that the jury have not been told, because they are the 12 people who have to decide the outcome of this case. The jury's hearing about each baby in turn. They've been told 13 babies were allegedly killed or harmed by Lucy Letby between June 2015 and April 2016. But today, Caroline, in this bonus episode, we're not focusing on any of the babies in the case. Today's focus is the nurse in the dock, who's at the centre of this trial. And that's because, Liz, in the last few days, we've gained a bit more of an insight into the private life of Lucy Letby. The jury's been shown a series of text messages which have shone a light on her as a person, not just a nurse. And we're going to explain what we've learned. We're also going to be joined by freelance journalist Louise Tickle, who's going to explain how journalists have finally been given access to the family court, which for many years have been able to make life-changing decisions in secret. Welcome to episode 21, The Defendant. So Liz, over the last few months since this trial began back in October last year, the court's mainly been hearing about the babies at the centre of the case and what the prosecution say happened to them. But so far the jury haven't heard much about the woman facing the allegations. And that's because, Caroline, her defence case hasn't started yet. Now, the jury can see her because she's brought to court every day and she's following proceedings intently from her seat behind the glass panelled dock in Court 7 at Manchester Crown Court. But the jury have yet to hear from her, so the snippets we know about her have only been gleaned from evidence so far presented by the prosecution. So what do we already know? Well, most of this has been revealed in text messages she exchanged with her colleagues, friends and her parents. We've heard that she attended salsa dancing and hula classes. She also liked watching Corrie, Strictly Come Dancing and Love Island in her spare time. We also know that in April 2016 she moved house and was planning a housewarming party with Prosecco and vodka for her colleagues. She also enjoyed a bet on the Grand National and she won £135 by backing the winner in the 2016 steeplechase, and that was on the same day she allegedly tried to kill a pair of twin boys on the unit. We also know that she had a close friendship with one of the doctors who worked at the hospital, 
who other nursing colleagues teased her about flirting with. So today, we're going to take a closer look at some of those messages and examine what they tell us about the nurse at the centre of this trial. So here we go. As usual, this first lot of messages, Caroline, have been voiced by actors. They start with Lucy Letby texting her colleague at about half past eight on June the 2nd, 2016. Now that was the day before an alleged attack on the next baby we're due to hear about in the case, Baby N. Had strange message from Dr A earlier. Did you? Saying what? Go commando. Laughing face. Laughing emojis. Asking when I was working next week, as wants to talk to me about something. Has a favour to ask? Think he likes you too? Hmm. Did you not ask what it was? No. Just said when I was working, and he said, wants my opinion on something. Hmm. Thinking emoji. Hmm. Do you think he's being odd? Thought as flirty as you. Shut up. What? I don't flirt with him. Okay. Certainly don't fancy him. Ha <laughs> ha. Just nice guy. Okay. Liz, you'll remember that a few weeks ago, a doctor was called to court to give evidence from behind a screen because his identity was being protected. And Lucy Letby got quite upset that day. Now, was this the doctor referred to in these messages, the so-called Dr A? Yeah, that's right. Um, This was during the case of Baby L. He's the twin boy Lucy Letby is accused of poisoning with insulin. Dr A told the jury why low sugar levels are so dangerous for premature babies. He explained it can cause illnesses, seizures and even brain damage. Now, when he gave his name to the court, before he started his evidence, Lucy Letby appeared visibly upset. She stood up abruptly to leave the dock. She had a hushed conversation with her solicitor, then agreed to carry on. So in this next exchange, Liz, between Lucy Letby and Dr A, we learn not only about the fact that she was having some problems associated with hypothyroidism, which means that she had an underactive thyroid, but also that she was planning a holiday. Yeah, the jury was shown messages which revealed that by June the 14th, 2016, Lucy Letby had worked six shifts in just eight days. She was working the following day as well, but was tired and looking forward to a week off in Ibiza. Now, we know Lucy Letby usually uses WhatsApp for messages. But the ones you're about to hear between her and Dr A are via Facebook Messenger, as you'll hear. They discuss another holiday she was due to go on with her parents in Devon the following month. Am I right in thinking you'll have done six long days in the last eight? No wonder you're tired. Yep, six and eight. My own doing, though, as holiday is during days off, rather than annual leave. Thank you. I'm having problems with my thyroid, which doesn't help. Just having some cereal and watching Corrie. Bonus that you didn't use any annual leave for your break. Are you going to Torbay again this year? Let me know if I can do anything endocrine to help. As well as coffee, cake and computers. I know my way around TFTs if you need any help. Yep, we are off to Torquay, 2nd July. My parents go three times a year. Thanks, a man of many talents. I've been hypothyroid since I was 11, having blips last 12 months. Just increased dose again, so see if that does the trick. Last time it was increased, I was over-treated and had tremors, etc. GP thinks thyroid's own function is declining with age. Does that sound reasonable? Yes, thyroid function can change with age, amongst other things. If you can't find a workable dose, there's always the option to block your own thyroid with carbimazole and establish an effective thyroxine dose. Have a good breakfast. I think your day may be busy. So just to give these messages a little bit of context, Liz, during this day shift before she went on leave, it's alleged Lucy Letby attacked baby N. Now, he'd been admitted to the unit with the blood clotting condition haemophilia. Yes, and over the course of her shift, she was messaging Dr A, who was on duty later that evening. Baby N's condition deteriorated, so Lucy Letby stayed late. Dr A offered her his car so she didn't have to walk home. The court heard he also brought chocolate in to cheer her up. We should say here that we're highlighting the personal parts of these messages. 
The messages which the jury have seen also contain a lot of technical medical details about the baby, who they were talking about and what was happening to him at the same time, some of which we've not included here. He's poorly, bled again, sat having a quiet moment and want to cry, just mad with so many people and lack of space, etc. Oh Lucy, poor little thing, are you okay? Have a cry, you'll feel better for it, I'm sure. You're welcome to take my car home if you're too tired to walk. I sort out picking it up in the morning. So sorry you've had a rubbish day at the end of your long run. Holiday, well and truly deserved. I'm okay, just feel like I've been running round all day and not really achieved anything positive for him. Don't want to cry in front of people here. Maybe when I'm home. That's very kind, Ari the car, but should be okay. Your day sounds as though it's been horrible. Poor you. Are you going to be okay? I'm sure he's had the best care possible today and that you will have done everything you can for him. Are you doing anything nice before you go on holiday? And tour bay in a few weeks' time. You're not having to do a long run of shifts to get the time off for that, are you? Take care. I'll be fine. You've had a rubbish sleep then. Seeing Kay tomorrow night, as it's her birthday. Otherwise, just sorting stuff at home, ready for holes. No, Torquay is a proper booked holiday. Off for nearly two weeks. Oh, what an end to a rubbish day. I haven't been back to Torbay for a few years. Must be nearly three. I'm always surprised by how little it changes when I go back. Happy memories. I used to love Cockington in the summer. It always looked so pretty when the flowers were out. Have you handed over yet? Cockington is gorgeous. We always go there for afternoon tea. Dad was offered a job in Paynton many moons ago. Could have been a very different childhood growing up by the sea. Looking forward to going back. Hope little man is okay and your night isn't too stressful. On the home straight now, at least. You are a sweetie. Thank you. Chocolate makes bad days a little better. Hope you liked it. That's true. Just a shame. I don't usually eat chocolate. But on this occasion... It was well deserved today. Are you okay? Yes, thank you. Just glad he's okay. Hopefully I'll sleep well tonight and can enjoy getting ready for holes. Are you okay? I'd be surprised if you didn't sleep well after so many long days. So Lucy Letby went off on her holiday to Ibiza and a week or so later on June the 23rd, she was back on duty. And on her first day back on the unit, she's accused of murdering the first of two brothers from a set of identical triplets. Dr A was also on the unit when baby O, who we'll hear more about later in the trial, collapsed and died. In the messages, Lucy Letby says it's rubbish Dr A is stuck in his clinic, so can't be on the neonatal unit. Later, when he offers to get her some lunch, she jokingly suggests tapas. The messages stop as the crisis with baby O unfolds on the shift, but they resume later on in the evening. They continue for several hours after she goes home. They say goodnight at half one in the morning. Are you okay? Think so. Just finishing my notes. Can't wait to get home. How are you? Had a moment in the car. Bit better now. Just walking home. Parents very grateful for everything. Nice to have some fresh air. Your notes must have taken a long time. Had you documented anything from this morning? Can't think straight, so took a while. Phew. Not the first day back you were expecting. I was glad you were there. Everything felt safe. Thank you for looking out for me. No, but it happens. Don't need to thank me. I'm pleased you were there. Think we work well together. Sorry for my loss of composure moment. I was trying to say thanks for checking I was okay. We do work well together. I'm glad you could talk to me, and I hope I helped. That's okay. Good to talk it through, otherwise carry it round. There are very few things that a hug can't help fix. One of those days. Thank you for keeping me company again. Sleep well. 
Don't be daft, it's a two-way thing, and what friends are for? You had me blubbering. Night. Oh no, how guilty do I feel? Good night. Guilty? I mean, you had to see me blubbering at work. Oops, my mistake. I thought it had tipped you over on the end of a bad day. Blubbering at work was normal for someone who cares about the babies and families that they look after. No, no, I'm fully composed. Thank you. A good cry is what's needed sometimes. Hope you sleep. Good night. So a bit of an insight there into the defendant in this trial via the messages released to the court in the last few days. And Lucy Letby, of course, denies all the charges against her. Now, we've all been hearing quite a lot over the past couple of weeks about a new pilot scheme to allow journalists to report on the family court proceedings for the first time. One journalist who's been at the centre of trying to report family courts for many years is our guest today. Do you want to introduce yourself and explain what you've been doing as a journalist for most of your career? I'm Louise Tickle. I am a journalist who, for the last eight years, I guess now, has specialised in reporting or trying to report on the family justice system, on family courts. So adoption, care proceedings, deprivation of liberty, when parents are in disputes over their children. And when I say trying to, I mean because, uh, yeah, until, until, well, it is sort of against the law. Until now, until this new pilot. As a journalist trying to cover the family courts, that makes life incredibly difficult. Yeah, so we, journalists have been allowed to go into private hearings in family courts since 2009. But there hasn't been very much point in us going because a law that was enacted in 1960 essentially said you can't report anything that goes on in there because if you do, it's a contempt of court, punishable by a potentially unlimited fine. And the other thing that you can't do is you can't identify any of the people who are involved in the family court proceedings until they come to an end, until there's a final order. And when you take those two bits of law together, essentially it means that you can't produce anything as a journalist that would help a reader or a listener relate to the people or understand their problems. One of my editors sent me to the Bristol court. I was doing an article for The Guardian about domestic abuse. And it was a point where there was big legal aid cuts, people who were saying that they were victims of domestic abuse who wanted injunctions to stop their alleged abuser contacting them were suddenly having to make these applications in family courts by themselves as what's known as a litigant in person. And I was being told it was terrifying and some of them weren't being very successful and were being refused. So I'd written this whole article about it and filed the piece. And my editor then said, well, you haven't gone down to a family court. I need to know what it's like. So off I trotted only to discover that I could sit in all the injunction hearings I wanted, but I wouldn't be able to describe what it was like for a litigant in person to try and make that application by herself, usually herself, to a judge. And I suddenly thought this is absolutely crazy. Louise, just to go back a little bit, for people who have never had any dealings with the family court, can you just walk us through the sort of range and extent of cases that are dealt with by the family court, which therefore might give people a sense of just how important it is now that journalists being allowed in may well lift a veil on, on a lot of this. There are often cases that are heard in family courts where potentially somebody might have been found not guilty of an offence in the criminal courts because that standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt hasn't been able to be reached. But where, for instance, nevertheless, their children who might have been affected by their crime are taken off them in family courts on a much lower standard of proof. And so you can be found not guilty of something in a criminal court, but still lose your kids in a family court. And the fact that these two things are happening, I think, sounds bizarre to lots of people and they don't understand it because we can't really explain it or why it's done. I think the other thing that's important to say is that, you know, there is a good reason why there are restrictions on reporting in family courts. I think the restriction on naming people is the right thing because people don't go to family courts because they are there necessarily as criminals. They're often at the most vulnerable, painful part of their life. Their family's broken down, their children are in crisis, they're in crisis. It's so distressing watching people in some family court hearings and the pain and trauma they're enduring. So the idea of that being splashed all over everywhere with your name, I think is really wrong. 
Yeah, I mean, serious decisions are made, aren't they, about, you know, people having their children taken into care, victims of domestic violence, all sorts of really serious, often kind of traumatic events that happen to ordinary people that in a criminal court would be splashed all over the newspapers and rightfully so and some because it's in the public interest that these cases are reported but like you said they they're so serious some of these cases but they've been held behind closed doors the state in family courts exerts really draconian powers like you said Liz you know your relationship your your legal relationship with your children can be extinguished in law by a family court judge when a child is placed for adoption you can have Just as a private individual, if your relationship splits up and it's very, very acrimonious and you end up, you know, in highly litigious court hearings, you can have your child removed from you and placed with the other parent with no right to see them on occasion. It's not often that it happens, but it can happen. Really big things happen out of sight and to date, really kind of out of mind and out of any public understanding. So, Louise, how will the pilot work And how will it change our understanding of the family courts and, you know, maybe allow a a greater level of scrutiny of the decisions that are being made there? This is broad brushstrokes, but essentially what it means is that whereas before we could go to court and we couldn't report anything, now in the pilot courts, which are Cardiff and Carlisle and Leeds, accredited journalists who've got a press card will be allowed to go to these courts and assuming that everything goes as planned and so far it has, you will be able to report whatever goes on in front of the judge as long as you carefully anonymise the family. Louise, that was fascinating. Thank you so much for your time and for talking to us. All right, take care. So that's it for this bonus episode. We'll be back on Monday to tell you more about baby N. He was a premature baby who the jury's been told was admitted to hospital because he had haemophilia. Lucy Letby is accused of trying to murder him three times on two separate shifts at the start of June 2016. She denies the charges. Thanks again for listening and don't forget you can follow the case by reading my daily reports in the Mail and on Mail Plus. Feel free to give us a rating and you can also follow us on Twitter at Lucy Letby Trial or send us an email at thetrialoflucyletby at gmail.com. See you then. Lucy Letby is accused of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others. While she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, Letby denies all of the charges over the incidents. Lucy Letby was the only person working on the night shift. It was alleged in court that their mother was apparently told by Miss Letby, trust me, I'm a nurse. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations, the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven infants and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. In total, there are 22 charges, all of which she denies. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail, I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week on this podcast, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. The case against Lucy Letby is that she murdered or tried to kill 17 babies while she was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. She denies the charges. The babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons, and the identities of their families are also being protected. They're known only as babies A to Q. Seven of the babies died. Ten survived. Each one of these babies was, or is, someone's son or daughter and the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. 
we'll be bringing you that detail as the jury is hearing it from the prosecution and defence. We're getting behind the headlines to explain far more than the news reports you'll be reading, watching and listening to. And the importance of a fair trial is paramount, so we won't be getting into anything in this podcast that the jury have not been told, because they are the 12 people who have to decide the outcome of this case. The jury's hearing about each baby in turn, and they've been told 13 babies were allegedly killed or harmed by Lucy Letby between June 2015 and April 2016. And today in this episode, we're focusing on the 14th baby in the case, a premature baby boy born around six weeks early. The prosecution say Lucy Letby tried to murder him three times on two separate shifts. The first allegation is that she injected him with air. The second, that she thrust a feeding tube or some other piece of medical equipment down his throat, causing him to bleed and collapse. And then, they say, she went on holiday to Ibiza. Welcome to episode 22, Baby N. So Liz, we're jumping ahead in time again now, aren't we? Because last week we heard about Baby K, who Lucy Letby's accused of attempting to murder in February 2016. Yes, and this week we're talking about Baby N, who she allegedly tried to kill in June 2016, so that's some four months later. Today we'll explain that Lucy Letby allegedly appeared to be quite agitated when a specialist team from Alder Hay Children's Hospital arrived on the neonatal unit to try and help Baby N and also that she gave his mother a hug after he stabilised while they were waiting to move him to Liverpool. OK, so Liz, let's unpick what the jury was told about this baby. So baby N was a baby boy, born around six weeks early at the beginning of June. He was delivered by a planned C-section because doctors were worried he wasn't growing properly in his mother's womb. And Liz, his case was unusual for the Countess because his mother was a carrier of haemophilia. Now, that's a genetic condition that affects boys and can stop their blood from clotting properly. In a statement, his mother told the court about her son's birth. I had a normal pregnancy up to 24 weeks when the hospital identified that my baby wasn't growing properly, so I was going for weekly scans. It was at our 32-week scan when I was booked in for a caesarean section because they needed him to come out as soon as possible in case the placenta failed. I was booked in because our son had haemophilia and they needed a few extra people in theatre in case he bled during his delivery. He was born at 33 weeks and didn't have any bleeds during the C-section. He was small, only £3.11, and quite jaundiced, and he went straight to the neonatal unit. So baby N was small, weighing around £3.11 when he was born, but he cried and he didn't need any resuscitation, and he was admitted to nursery one in the neonatal unit when he was 20 minutes old. And the court heard that on his first day of life, he had a few problems with his breathing and doctors were worried he had an infection, so they started him on antibiotics. He was also receiving treatment for jaundice. Now, around six hours after his birth, Lucy Letby came on duty to begin a night shift. And soon after, she texted a colleague who wasn't at work, telling her the unit had a baby with haemophilia and everyone seemed a bit panicked and she didn't know much about it, so she was going to Google it. Now, on this shift, Lucy Letby wasn't Baby N's designated nurse, Liz. That was somebody called Nurse Christopher Booth. Now, he had Baby N and another baby in Nursery 1. Lucy Letby was working after two babies in Nursery 4. And throughout the evening, the jury heard Baby N improved and was stable. But, Liz, within two hours, that all changed. That's right. At around 1am, Nurse Booth went on his break. In a statement, he said he asked one of his colleagues to keep an eye on Baby N, but he couldn't remember which one. And seven minutes later, while he was away, Baby N started screaming. His oxygen levels dropped dangerously low, and his skin appeared mottled and dusky, jurors were told. Now this is significant because it's the prosecution case that while Nurse Booth was on his break, Lucy Letby attacked Baby N, either by inflicting some kind of injury on him or by injecting air into his bloodstream. Baby N needed several minutes of oxygen via a mask before he recovered. Dr Jennifer Lucknane was the registrar on duty, and she was crash bleeped to come. Now she appeared in court and told the jury she couldn't directly remember the incident, but it was unusual for her to use the word screaming in her notes, so she assumed he must have been particularly upset. 
At 20 past one, she was called away to another emergency on the maternity ward, but she said she came back to check on baby N just before 2am, and by then she said he'd stabilised and had no further problems on the shift. And over the next 12 days, baby N did well. He moved down through the rooms on the unit, and on June the 14th, doctors told his parents that they could take him home the following day. But that never happened, because the following day, on June the 15th, Lucy Letby allegedly tried to kill him twice on the same shift by thrusting a tube or a piece of medical equipment down his throat, causing him to bleed and collapse. So Liz, take us through what the prosecution allege happened. OK, Caroline. So the jury heard that June the 15th was Lucy Letby's final shift before she went off to Ibiza on holiday. It was her seventh shift in nine days, in fact, and text messages read to the court show that she was tired and ready for a break. So Lucy Letby was due to start her day shift, as usual, at around half past seven in the morning. But the jury were told that even before she arrived at the hospital, she knew baby N hadn't been very well overnight. Yes, that's because one of her colleagues, who'd been working the night shift, had already texted her to say baby N looked like shit and was being screened for an infection. He'd suffered several dips in his oxygen levels. His skin was mottled and a decision had also been taken to stop his milk feeds. So the jury was told that the first thing Lucy Letby did when she arrived on the unit just before quarter past seven in the morning was go and see how baby N was doing. Yes, nursery nurse Jennifer Jones Key had been looking after baby N overnight. She told the jury that she was feeding another baby in the same room when Lucy Letby popped into the nursery to say hello. And moments later, baby N collapsed. Nurse Jones Key told the court, I remember Lucy looking over because he had gone a bit pale and the monitor went off and we started neo-puffing. So they moved baby N to nursery one so he could be more closely monitored and to put him onto a ventilator to help with his breathing. But when the registrar on duty, who we're calling Dr A, attempted to put the breathing tube down his throat, the court heard he was surprised by what he found. Giving evidence from behind a screen, he said, I saw blood at the back of the throat. I saw blood that prevented me from seeing where the entry to his airway was. It was unusual. There was a degree of swelling. He said Lucy Letby was assisting him when he was trying to get the tube into baby N's airway, but after the third attempt, he gave up. Now, we should mention here that this is the same doctor, we're calling Dr A, who Lucy Letby exchanged messages with during this shift. You might remember colleagues were teasing her about flirting with him. She actually denied fancying him, saying he was just a nice guy. If you listen to our bonus episode that we released last Friday, you can hear all those exchanges there. And the prosecution say what Dr A saw is significant. They say baby N's throat was bleeding and was swollen because he'd been injured deliberately by Lucy Letby. So baby N was moved back to nursery one, placed on a monitor, and oxygen was being given to him via a mask because he couldn't be put on a ventilator. Lucy Letby was actually assigned by the shift leader to look after him. And remember, his parents were hoping to take him home that day, so they were surprised to receive a phone call saying he was unwell and that they needed to come to the hospital as soon as they could. In a statement, his father described what happened. The day our son was due to come home, I was at work. I received a phone call from his nurse, Lucy. She said he'd been a bit unwell in the night, but said that he was okay now. I told Lucy my partner would be in to see him. She didn't give me the impression that he was still unwell or that we needed to be concerned. About 10 minutes later, my partner rang me and said we needed to go to the hospital. It was about 9am when we arrived. Our son was in the intensive care room and Lucy was with him. Lucy was by his bed, either checking the monitor or doing his cares, changing him. There was no urgency when we arrived. Lucy said, he's been a bit unwell in the night. When I saw him, I was shocked. His skin was bluish in colour. It was all over his body. There was dried blood on his lips and around his mouth. His lips were not covered in blood, but there was lots of blood splatters. It was dry, a dark reddy brown colour. I remember feeling confused and thinking, what's wrong with him? The jury was told that over the course of the next few hours, baby N improved slightly but was still unwell and at 2.50pm he deteriorated again. 
Yes, and this happened while his parents were briefly away from the unit to get some food. He suffered another profound drop in his oxygen levels and heart rate, and according to a note written by Lucy Letby, three millilitres of blood was removed from the feeding tube in his nose. Now, Dr Hugh Maybury was the registrar on duty and he was crash bleeped to help, along with a female doctor who we can't name for legal reasons. Dr Maybury used a bag and a mask to deliver oxygen to baby N and he improved. He also called the consultant on duty, Dr Murthy Saladi, for help. This again is significant, the prosecution say, because this is the second time on the shift that Lucy Letby attacked baby N and allegedly tried to kill him. While he was waiting for Dr Saladi to arrive, Dr Maybury tried to put a breathing tube down baby N's airway, but he told the court he couldn't do it because of substantial swelling in his throat, the like of which he'd never seen before. Dr Saladi also tried to insert the tube when he arrived, but failed, as did the female doctor, who couldn't do it either. Jurors were told that Dr Stephen Breary, the senior consultant in charge of the unit, was also asked to come and help. He couldn't intubate baby N either, so he asked two of the hospital anaesthetists to attend. Once again, neither of them could get the tube in. In the end, Dr Breary put an alternative, temporary breathing tube and mask into baby N's upper airway as a stopgap to make sure he was still getting oxygen. So let's just to summarise all of that, seven doctors from the Countess tried to intubate baby N over a number of hours and all failed because of this unusual swelling in his throat. Yes, and by the time the senior consultant, Dr John Gibbs, came on duty at 6pm, calls had already been made to Walder Hay Children's Hospital, who unusually agreed to send over two of their most experienced intensive care doctors and an ear, nose and throat surgeon to try and help. The plan was for them to try to get the tube into baby N's airway. As a last resort, they were prepared to operate and perform a tracheotomy. That's where an incision is made in the front of the neck and a tube inserted to get oxygen in that way. But the female doctor, who we can't name, told the court that Lucy Letby appeared agitated when the team arrived. She accepted when questioned by prosecuting barrister Simon Driver that everyone dealt with stressful emergency situations differently. But she said, I remember, and it struck me at the time, that she seemed quite agitated. When they arrived, she approached me a few times and said, Who are these people? Who are these people? The doctor said that in her experience of working with doctors and nurses at Chester during an emergency, it seemed quite out of character. And as it happened, Liz, the team from Alderhay arrived just in the nick of time because baby N collapsed again. They'd been on the neonatal unit for a matter of minutes when baby N's oxygen levels plummeted. This time it was more serious and life-threatening because his heart rate also dropped. Dr Gibbs and the team from Alderhay rushed to help and chest compressions began at 7.47pm. At the same time, baby N was given his first dose of adrenaline to try and kickstart his heart. A second dose was administered three minutes later, followed by a third at 7.53pm, but baby N failed to respond. Now one of the doctors who'd come over from Alderhay was an intensive care consultant called Frank Potter. Dr Potter had almost 30 years' experience in paediatric medicine, so he stepped in to have a go at putting in the breathing tube. By this point, just to remind you, he was the eighth doctor to try. Thankfully, he succeeded at the first attempt just before 8pm. And this, Dr Gibbs said, significantly improved the amount of oxygen getting to baby N. The CPR continued until around nine minutes past eight and he needed another three doses of adrenaline before his heart rate picked up and he began to stabilise. Baby N's father described what he witnessed in a statement to the court. After he'd been stable for a couple of hours, my partner and I decided to go and get some food because we had not eaten that day. We were probably gone 20 to 25 minutes, and when we got back, the parents whose baby was also in nursery one were sat outside. I noticed the blinds were down in the intensive care room, whereas they had previously been up. Someone came from the nurse's desk and spoke to us. They said our son was really unwell and we could see a priest. I was scared. My partner went into the intensive care room. Our son then seemed to stabilise for a bit and my partner was feeling unwell and we got a doctor to see her. Someone came into the maternity unit and said, you better come, he's bad again. He's really ill this time. We ran up the corridor to the intensive care unit and when we arrived, 
they were doing resuscitation on our son. There were a lot of people in there. There were also people from Older Hay Children's Hospital there. He eventually got the breathing tube into our son. After it was fitted, he stabilised a bit. When I say stabilised, he wasn't having CPR. He calmed down. We were sat outside the intensive care room. There were a lot of people seeing to our son, so we were staying out of the way. Lucy Letby came up to us and said she stayed on late after her shift. She said to my partner, I hope he's all right, and gave her a hug. She might have given her a kiss. I'm not sure. And Dr Gibbs also described what happened. He said it was a very serious, life-threatening situation. He took time but did start to steadily improve. He still needed further doses of adrenaline, even after he'd been ventilated by Dr Posser. He had six doses over 30 minutes. Soon afterwards, at around 8.45pm, baby N was baptised. His mother told the court in her statement that Lucy Letby had suggested he be christened by the hospital chaplain earlier that afternoon, and his parents had agreed. And after being stabilised, baby M was finally transferred to Alder Hay at around 11.20pm. There he recovered quickly, and within days he was moved out of intensive care. He remained at the hospital for 10 days before being discharged. But he later suffered several episodes where he stopped breathing and had to be readmitted around a week later. Further tests were carried out, but they failed to find a cause, the jury was told, and he did recover. He's now almost seven years old. And it's important to point out here, Caroline, that Lucy Letby is charged with trying to kill Baby N three times. Once on June the 3rd, and twice on June the 15th, at around half past seven in the morning, and again at ten to three in the afternoon. She's not charged in connection with his life-threatening collapse at around 7.40pm. So Liz, that's what the prosecution say happened to baby N. Lucy Letby denies all these charges, so why do her defence say she is not responsible? Well, Ben Myers Casey, Lucy Letby's barrister, said baby N was a haemophiliac, which made him prone to bleeding. He said he'd received suboptimal care at the Countess and should have been treated at a more specialist centre. Now, Professor Sally Kinsey, who is an expert in haemophilia, was called by the prosecution. She told the court that baby N's blood disorder did make him more likely to bleed, but she also insisted he wouldn't just bleed for no reason. She also said his haemophilia was moderate and he didn't suffer any spontaneous bleeds during his time on the unit. Both prosecution expert witnesses, Dr Dowie Evans and Dr Sandy Bowen, gave evidence that the screaming associated with baby N's collapse on June 3rd was very unusual. Dr Evans said the circumstances of baby D's collapse fitted with research he'd read on air embolus, or air being injected into the bloodstream, and it was a repeat of what the jury had been told earlier on in the trial, in the cases of baby E and baby I. But Mr Myers said there was no evidence to suggest air embolus was to blame, and he accused Dr Evans of coming up with that theory only after it was suggested by police, something he vehemently denied. Mr Myers said baby N's deterioration and mottled appearance the night before the two collapses on June the 15th could indicate an infection or an internal bleed in his stomach or lungs. But the court heard that doctors who treated baby N ruled these out. They said blood test results, which came back a few days later, were clear and a bleed in the lungs or stomach was unlikely because he hadn't been on a ventilator for any length of time and he'd also been feeding normally. Mr Myers also suggested that the doctor who first tried to intubate baby N on June the 15th could have inadvertently caused the bleeding in his throat. Although he said he couldn't be certain, Dr A said he thought he saw the blood during his first attempt to get the tube inside the baby's airway. He said if he had caused the bleeding then he would have seen blood along the root of the instrument he was using to open the child's airway, which he did not. And Dr Stephen Breary, the consultant in charge of the neonatal unit, who reviewed baby N's care immediately afterwards, told jurors he could find no natural reason why he collapsed. He said there was no evidence of infection in baby N. There was also no abnormalities identified with his throat or heart. I can't see a reason why this baby collapsed and deteriorated on multiple occasions as he did, Dr Breary said. I can't think of a natural cause for why this occurred. (laughs) 
So that's it for episode 22. We'll be back next week to tell you about the next two babies in the case, baby O and baby P. They were brothers, two of a set of identical triplets who Lucy let be allegedly murdered on consecutive days at the end of June 2016, soon after she came back to work from the holiday in Ibiza. Their surviving brother was transferred to another hospital after their deaths and he isn't part of the case. I'll be in court to listen to the evidence and you can read my daily reports in the mail and on Mail Plus. You can give us a rating and you can follow us on Twitter at Lucy Letby Trial or send us an email at thetrialofluciletby at gmail.com. See you then.